afternoon. Um, the first of our, of our seminar, we're going to have three talks, and then we'll take a short coffee break, then we'll reconvene for a panel discussion, and um, you all will have an opportunity to ask questions of the panel members and of the speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. George Strawn. Dr. Strawn has his PhD in mathematics from Iowa State University. He served as systems engineer and marketing representative with IBM, and also as the regional manager of the sy and of systems engineering with the Compaq Corporation. He's currently um, has a joint appointment at Iowa State <coughs> University, where he's uh, assistant professor with the computer science department and systems co coordinator of the Iowa State Computation Center. Dr. Strong. I'm programmed to talk for 50 minutes, so uh, I'm going to do my best with a borrowed wristwatch and everything to see that that doesn't happen today. Uh, the computer scientists in the audience can turn their hearing aid down for the first 20 minutes. I probably won't have much to say to you that you haven't heard before. Uh, I have a rather non-technical uh, talk to um, set, set the stage, perhaps, for discussion of particular uh, database activity and its uh, social implications. There are three things that I uh, wanted to do in the 20 minutes allotted to me, so that gives me six and two-thirds minutes, I guess, each, and I'd better get started. The three things I want to do is give a brief history of uh, computer database technology uh, to expose the source of power of the computer in database technology and to establish a uh, friendly, if cautious, attitude towards the computer and database technology. <coughs> After all, I must perform the last for job security purposes. I must attempt the last, at least. Uh, so you, you, you really can't blame me in, in that regard. Um, now, so that the talk wouldn't be uh, too monotonous, I did bring along some visuals to uh, illustrate my, my discussion. Here's the first visual I have. In case, you, uh, in case you're wondering what this is, it's a box of data processing cards. I simply have this here for, uh, for illustration, and because the first word of history that I wanted to say about database technology really does begin with the punch card and punch card technology. Well, circa 1890, perhaps some of you have heard this story before about the uh, uh, census in the last half or last part of the 19th century. The uh, uh, manual census processing of 1880 was finished in 1887, and the projection was that the 1890 census would uh, be processed by 1904 or 05, some five or six years after the 1900 census had been taken. And of course, projections for the future were, uh, for the more distant future, were even more abysmal. Well, uh, it was about this time that uh, punch card processing came into existence. And uh, with the existence of electromechanical punch card equipment, uh, the day was saved, and the 1890 census was, in fact, completed in somewhere between 1893 and 1894. And then for the remainder of that century and the first half, let's say, of the 20th century, uh, electromechanical punch card processing equipment constituted what you would call database technology in uh, uh, business and industry. Well, the computers which were commercially introduced into this country and the world uh, in 1950 uh, began as punch card processing devices. Uh, it wasn't long, though, uh, indeed in the first decade of their existence, when need for faster input-output devices was noted. And enter uh, visual number two, which uh, perhaps you're also familiar with, we have a reel of magnetic tape. 
Now, you can, if you will, uh, consider this reel of magnetic tape to be a big box of cards because, indeed, magnetic tape was processed by computers in almost identical fashion to the way <coughs> boxes of punch cards were processed by uh, electromechanical uh, card processing equipment. Now, it is true that this one reel of tape is the equivalent of approximately 100 of these boxes of cards. Uh, so you can see there was a rather significant increase in the density of information, as indeed a rather significant increase in the uh, speed of processing. Uh, you'd be lucky if you could process uh, um, several hundred cards a minute. Now you could process perhaps several thousand equivalent cards stored on magnetic tape. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, tape level technology of computers, uh, one small anecdote that I'll mention there concerns the banking industry, where, uh, of course, uh, prior to the advent of computing, uh, processing of canceled check checks was done by manual <coughs> methods. And long about the middle of the century, people were getting nervous about bank processing, just as they had been getting nervous about taking census data some 50 or 60 years before. Indeed, it was estimated that by 1975, next year, this estimate was made some 20 years ago, it was, it was estimated that by 1975, without the advent of uh, magnetic tape-supported computer processing, that it would take every woman in the country between the ages of 18 and 65 to process canceled checks in the nation's <coughs> banking. Uh, well, that's, I guess, today can be viewed as a sexist anecdote since, uh, since we mentioned women only, and uh, I, I hope I won't be taken to task for that in the changing climate. In any event, um, a another illustration, I would say, of uh, of computing technology uh, to the rescue of the way we do business or the way we had been doing business in this country. One other uh, application of uh, magnetic tape technology that uh, might uh, comment briefly on involves something known as literature searching. Uh, we do a fair amount of this on this campus as uh, a particular instance. It boils down to the following. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, uh, we've been uh, living in the face for some time now of something called the information explosion, where the amount of information available doubles every, what is it now, 10 years or something like that. Uh, <coughs> terrific explosion of the amount of information uh, present uh, to be assimilated. Take, for example, the, uh, the case of the researcher who's trying to stay current in some field. This, this has uh, uh, similar implications uh, elsewhere, of course. Um, for an individual to remain um, conversant with the literature that's coming out in his field has become a rather uh, Herculean task in many fields. Well, uh, literature searching supported by uh, such thing as magnetic tape processing uh, computer database technology has come to the rescue in this case. Um, that is, uh, each researcher is given a profile in the sense of listing things that he's interested in, controlled by keywords or phrases stating his research interests. And then all of the, um, uh, or at least many of the uh, research documents published in his field are placed as a database on magnetic tape, and on a periodic basis, the uh, user's profile is matched against the records where the records, say, represent the titles and or abstracts of documents which have been published recently, and a listing then of the objects, the, the, the documents which might be of interest to this researcher are presented to the researcher for his um, uh, following up, uh, either by, again, by computing uh, uh, techniques or by manual techniques. But in any event, the vast extent of the literature, the initial survey of this literature is done by the computer to uh, save the researcher and his staff the uh, uh, rather, uh, rather terrific job of, of literature searching. Now, um, in this uh, uh, 
anecdotal uh, presentation, we come to what I would call a fundamental change in the uh, uh, visuals. And uh, it looks like this. This is a magnetic disk device. And whereas I say these two devices are rather similar, I say this device is rather different. The reason is, and uh, although I, uh, it's uh, fixed so I can't get the protective cover off, but as, as you see, it's, it's a bunch of spindles. Uh, on a spindle, there's a bunch of platters. And on the platter are uh, magnetic uh, coatings. And uh, organized the way it is, a comb-type read-write mechanism has the ability to jump around within the device going from here to the inside to the middle to back out and so on and so forth on a very brief um, response, certainly brief with respect to, say, the reel of tape, where if you, um, first of all, are interested in the first record that's stored on the tape, but then you're interested in a record that's way down here in the inside, what are you going to do? You're going to spin that tape. And that may take you five minutes, or on the order of a few minutes at least, to do so. Whereas uh, these two devices, by the way, contain approximately the same amount of information. Again, either one about the equivalent of 100 boxes of cards. This one, we are talking about fractional seconds to access any piece of information stored on the device. Uh, I don't care where it is, on the inside, the outside, the top, the bottom. Because of the technology, the way the thing is constructed, you have immediate access, or as we say in the big time, direct access, to any of the information uh, stored thereon. Um, this has made a rather fundamental change in uh, database technology, especially in light of a concurrent development, which is the one other technological development that uh, bears brief comment, and that is uh, what we'd call the area of data communications. If you will, computers talking to computers over telephone lines or individuals talking to computers over telephone lines. You see, if the information base that is computerized is stored on devices such as this, which are directly accessible, now it becomes uh, a couple that technological advance with the advance of uh, uh, data communications, it becomes immediately possible for computers to be able to respond quote, instantaneously, or at least within the, uh, the tolerance of a human being, to wait for the answer. No longer are computer jobs batched, and uh, every week we run the tape and, and update it, and uh, therefore I can't check on your bill, and I don't know why it's wrong, because our computer doesn't let you do that sort of thing. You know, the, the usual thing you get when your utility bill is fouled up. Well, the, the utility bills are stored on tapes, and it's too expensive to do anything other than run it once a week or once a month and so forth. Well, as more and more uh, data uh, bases are transferred from these sequential devices to these direct access devices, you see it becomes capable to inquire about the information that is stored and get uh, instantaneous or at least very quick response on the order of seconds as opposed to the order of days or hours or what have you. Um, one, uh, one application illustration here, I guess, before I'm done with that sort of thing. Um, it is now possible um, for libraries to subscribe to a service that uh, at, at some point in the country has the uh, card catalog of the Library of Congress on direct access computer uh, uh, storage. Uh, this is um, to be used, as I understand, for such purposes as updating one's own card catalog, inquiring for new acquisitions, and so on and so forth. In fact, you see, um, the idea would be that uh, our library or some library uh, subscribing to this service would have a small computing device uh, at their location, and if they have just, a, if we've just acquired a new book, we simply dial up this computer database, which has the entire Library of Congress card catalog. Uh, we say we just got such and such a book. That uh, card is immediately found from the database um, and is transmitted over the phone lines, and a duplicate is typed out locally, which we may then take and place into our card catalog uh, or some such thing. I, I understand the cost of preparing these cards individually is not small. 
So this is an economically attractive uh, application. Well, uh, my understanding is, to carry this illustration a little further, that there has been uh, um, a rather expansive or um, uh, future-minded uh, project under consideration in the Library of Congress for some time now, which says that by the year 2000, not only the card catalog of the Library of Congress, but the entire Library of Congress, all the documents in the Library of Congress, will be stored on direct access devices like this. Uh, as an um, illustration, uh, certainly by that time all our homes will have small computing devices, you see, uh, uh, similar to a, a television tube with a, a typewriter uh, keyboard for communication, probably. And uh, you can envision yourself in, in the year 2000 or 2001, presuming they might miss their schedule a little, um, which um, you'll sit down and you'll dial up the Library of Congress and you'll say, I'd like to start scrolling through such and such a document, you see, a, a book if you're interested in or whatever. And, of course, you get a rather quick response and then you can start on your television screen paging through this document, observing the uh, uh, whatever you will. Uh, in any event, uh, the, the point of this uh, illustration is the fact that tremendous volumes of data are now being envisioned to be stored on directly, quickly accessible computer mediums, and that this coupled with the data communications breakthroughs that have recently occurred mean that this type of information is readily available to a rather large base of individuals, a rather large cross-section of individuals, and certainly it's going to uh, continue in that direction. Um, well, uh, what I, I said I, I, I wanted to expose the source of power of the computer. There really isn't anything that I've described that couldn't have been done in 1800, theoretically. Right? You know, you could have, a, instead of the card, you could have had sheets of paper. And these sheets of paper could have been written on. And if you wanted to find something, you could go rummage through that sheet of paper, that uh, paper file, and find it, and so forth. Um, the real source of power for the computer is, it can be summarized in one word, and that's speed. It doesn't really allow you to do anything different. It only allows you to do what you could have done before faster. Well, now, really, that's stating it too weakly, of course. Uh, as someone once said, and I think he's probably right, if you can do something ten times faster than you were previously doing it, you think you've just introduced a quantitative change in what was going on, but you've probably introduced a qualitative change in what was going on. That is to say, if you can do something at least 10 times faster, and of course now we're talking about thousands of times faster, um, the, the mere change of, of the speed of doing something has caused a qualitative change in the situation. Because things that you otherwise wouldn't have even dreamed of attempting now can be done routinely. It's not that the way that these things are done is so mysterious. It's just that now they can be done fast enough to make uh, their doing uh, feasible, uh, both economically and, and from a time-wise time standpoint. Uh, well, I, I say we should have a cautious but friendly attitude toward the computer and database technology. You see, the, some of the, uh, the earlier illustrations that I, I chose, I, I would think, would support the statement that um, computer and database technology, as it's developed in the last 20 years, has been the invention which has kept our economy from stagnating under the effects of the information explosion. That without these uh, vastly increased speeds of processing, uh, something would have had to, to give. Well. <coughs> It didn't have to give because of the development of uh, computing and database technology. In fact, it has been said that the computer is the second most important invention of man, the first being written language. Well, whether or not that comes to pass, I suppose uh, we have yet to see. But it's a 
it's a rather positive statement. I would say that, um, in closing, that uh, perhaps the, uh, the computer and database technology is something like atomic energy. Uh, quite dangerous, quite dangerous, but has uh, a lot of potential in peaceful use in the generation of energy. And though, therefore, even though it's dangerous, it uh, perhaps, uh, like atomic energy, may ultimately be necessary for our survival in our society. Uh, and with that uh, framework or that attitude, uh, and, uh, this discussion is about to, to go on and consider the very necessary aspects of control. Because just as in the case of atomic energy, where uh, one doesn't want to build a reactor in the center of a city without uh, knowing that there's a fair chance that it won't blow up, uh, there's also a grave need to consider the terrific power of the computer uh, and for the sake of uh, society and its individuals uh, know that we are uh, taking steps to control this great power. But uh, that's not my part of the discussion and I'll terminate and we'll get on to the more important aspects. Now that you're all experts in computerized databases, I think it'd be a, a good time to take a look at an example of a current ongoing computerized database. And here to do that, we have Carol Bidler, who's going to talk about TRACES. The word TRACES stands for Traffic Records and Criminal Justice Information System, which is in operation in Des Moines. Mr. Bidler has served as the Chief Administrative Officer with the Public Saf Safety Department, and his work with the TRACES project began in 1971 when he was appointed Deputy Commissioner, and in January of this year, he was appointed Executive Director of TRACES. Thank you, Professor Young. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. When I was asked to speak about the TRACES system and what TRACES is, I decided immediately that the first thing that we have to, to make very clear when we talk about TRACES is that TRACES is only a computerized information system containing public record information in the traffic records and criminal justice areas. And please note that I indicate that TRACES contains public record information. By that I mean that the only information contained within the TRACES system is information currently required by the state to be kept by state statute. And in addition to being an information system, TRACES fulfills the role of a communications system. In a nutshell, therefore, TRACES stores and disseminates information necessary for the enforcement of the traffic and criminal laws of the state of Iowa. In order to understand the TRACES system, it is necessary to understand the various files within the TRACES system and to know a little bit about what each of the various files are designed to accomplish. As the name TRACES implies, it is actually a combination of two databases, a traffic records database and a criminal justice database. The traffic records database includes three basic files. That's a driver's license file, a motor vehicle registration and title file, and an accident file. The driver's license file is designed to meet four basic objectives. The first, the system must support the state's driver's licensing activities, including the issuance and reissuance of licenses, <coughs> the reexamination of drivers, and provide a unique identification for each driver within the state. Second, the system must provide positive correlation between the licensed driver and vehicles registered within the state by the name or dri driver's license number of the individual. Third, the system must provide <coughs> for data necessary for the identification of problem drivers and the determination of appropriate action to be taken by the licensing authority. Fourth, the system must support the administration of the state's financial responsibility laws and the collection of fees associated with driver licensing. There are approximately 1,800,000 licensed drivers in the state of Iowa and about 800,000 of these individuals have their licenses 
issued or renewed in, e in any given year. In 1973, there were a million, or I'm sorry, 174,572 convictions for moving traffic violations in Iowa, and the state suspended or revoked about 14,000 driver's licenses. In addition to the record-keeping functions of the driver's license division, the system must also provide an, a rapid access method in order to provide timely information relating to the validity of a driver's license and the suspension or revocation of that license for enforcement officials throughout the state. The motor vehicle subsystem provides information concerning titles of ownership of motor vehicles within the state and registration information concerning these vehicles. Primarily, the database is designed to support the state's functions relating to the registration and titling of motor vehicles. The second objective is to provide for the collection and maintenance of history records relating to the theft and abandonment of motor vehicles and to assist state authorities in, a, in the identification, recovery, and return of stolen vehicles and the removal of abandoned vehicles as hazards to traffic operation and safety. Third, the system provides for the collection and maintenance of history records relating to the mechanical condition of vehicles registered to the state, and finally, the system supports the state's administrative function relating to the title and lien laws and the collection of fees associated with vehicle registration and title issuance. There are approximately two million motor vehicles registered within the state of Iowa, and as you're each aware, each of these vehicles must be re-registered between December and March of each year. Through the TRACES system, the state preprints registration renewal forms and provides to the county treasurers prior to the registration renewal period preprinted forms for the county treasurer to use in <coughs> updating the registration of your vehicle. And finally, the major, the final major traffic file is the accident file. And the accident file uh, provides information relating to traffic accidents and the vehicles and individuals involved in those accidents. During 1973, there were about 113,000 accidents reported to the Department of Public Safety resulting in 813 fatalities, thousands of personal injuries, and millions of dollars in property damage. The accident subsystem provides for the collection of data concerning <coughs> the vehicles, the drivers, the roadways involved, and the results of those accidents on the persons and vehicles involved. The file provides a method of traffic safety analysis through the manipulation of data gathered from accident reports. Specifically, the file is used by the Department of Public Safety for the analysis of human and vehicle factors involved in the causation of accidents. It's used by the State Highway Commi Commission for the analysis of roadway environmental characteristics which contribute to accidents. It's used by the Department of Public Instruction to determine the effectiveness of driver training programs and driver improvement programs carried out with, uh, with the Department of Public Instruction. <coughs> and finally, it's used by police authorities to determine high accident locations <coughs> and to determine enforcement policies to impact upon the high accident locations. The second half of the TRACES system is a criminal justice information system. Within the criminal justice information system, the, uh, the files, the databases cover such things as uh, wanted persons, stolen property, including, including stolen guns, stolen articles, vehicles, livestock, a computerized criminal history file, a correctional status file, and a criminal reporting file, including uniform crime reports, crime incident reports, uniform disposition reports, and a serious crime file. The wanted person file is a file containing basic data concerning individuals who uh, have a warrant issued for their arrest or who are either <coughs> uh, reported to a police agency as being missing, missing persons or runaways. Basically, the wanted person's file is broken into two separate categories. The first being those individuals wanted for what we call a criterion <coughs> offense or a major offense in which the state is willing to extradite the individual from another state. And the second portion being those individuals who are wanted within Iowa, however, the state would not be willing to extradite the individual if he were picked up in another state. Included in this database is the name and address and date of birth, the crime for which the individual is wanted, the jurisdiction issuing the warrant, and other personal data concerning the individuals wanted. If the individual is arrested or stopped for a moving traffic violation, a peace officer can qu inquire into this database to determine whether or not the individual is wanted in Iowa or anywhere else within the nation. The stolen property files constitute the next portion of the criminal justice information system. 
These files are broken down into a stolen, a stolen guns file, a stolen articles file, a stolen securities file, a stolen vehicle file, which includes not only vehicles, but stolen license plates and vehicle parts, such as motors, transmissions, things like this, and a stolen livestock file. Each article placed within this file must be identifiable by, identifiable by name or brand name, serial number, or other identifying and unique characteristic. And it, the database must include the original owner of the item, the time and place and date of the theft. The file further provides for the identification of property recovered where an arrests are made for various offenses or where uh, property is recovered through one means or another. The next file, and the one which has received the majority of publicity throughout Iowa and throughout the nation for that matter, is the computerized criminal history file. This file will contain the name, address, sex, date of birth, and other personal identifying characteristics of all individuals arrested and convicted for an indictable misdemeanor or a <coughs> felony within the state. When I say the file would contain information concerning all people arrested and convicted, I mean all that are arrested and convicted after the effective date of the implement implementation of the file. The Department of Public Safety currently has criminal history files on approximately 300,000 individuals. And we have no intention and couldn't possibly, if we wanted to, computerize the criminal history of all of those individuals. We anticipate computerizing about the records of about 6,000 individuals who we consider to be uh, either currently active in criminal uh, activity or who are somewhere within the criminal justice system, either uh, have been arrested in a waiting trial or in a correctional institution on probation or parole or have been recently released from one of those types of institutions. And within a certain period of time after an individual is ultimately released from control by a correctional institution, uh, we anticipate removing the information concerning that individual from the automated file and only maintaining it in a manual file. The reason for this is if an individual has a criminal record and he has no no further activity after some period of time, say five, seven, ten years, the exact time hasn't been established yet. Uh, there's no need to keep that information online in a computerized system for immediate access. The, the information would still be available, however it would be available through the manual files rather than through <coughs> the automated files. <coughs> uh, each individual's criminal history file is identified by fingerprint records and contains the time, place of arrest and conviction of his first arrest with all, along with all subsequent arrests and convictions. If, however, an individual has only been arrested once and he has either been found not guilty or charges dismissed against the individual for that arrest, the arrest information is purged from both the automated and manual files of the department and are returned to the arresting agency so that they can also purge the fingerprints and the arrest information from their files. The next file within the criminal justice system is the correctional status file. This file would contain information concerning all individuals convicted of an indictable misdemeanor or felony and who are still under the supervision of the state and his current status within the correctional system. That is, the individual is the individual out on probation or parole? Is he incarcerated in a state or local penal institution? Does he have a work release or other privileges that would allow him to be outside the institution at various times? And other information concerning the individual that would be uh, necessary and useful for law enforcement purposes. Finally, the TRACES system will include a crime report information system, uh, including crime incident reports, <coughs> uniform disposition reports, uniform crime reports, and other information concerning criminal activity within the state. As of this time, the state of Iowa has no uniform crime reporting system or a method of keeping track of the number of reported crimes and the portion of those crimes that are solved within the state. State and local agencies do participate in the National Federal Uniform Crime Reporting System to a large extent. However, the system does not enjoy full participation by all police agencies, nor do, is there any method of verifying the accuracy of the data supplied to the FBI. Through the Crime Incident Reporting System, each local enforcement agency throughout the state would report to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation information concerning crimes reported within their jurisdiction. They further would be required to report information concerning all arrests and the final disposition of those arrests, whether or not the individual was uh, bound over to <coughs> for trial or released by the police agency or the county attorney or whatever the final disposition of that arrest was. Then the system is finally designed to annually print <coughs> out a list of all arrests for which no final disposition has been reported to the department 
so that notify so that we can notify the arresting agency that we do not have disposition report on those individuals arrested in their a their jurisdiction and they can follow up and provide us with disposition reports I mentioned earlier that the traces system in addition to being an information system is a communication system let me <coughs> briefly explain how traces is a communication system in order to provide rapid access and by rapid access we mean two minutes or less to the information st stored within the computer system it is necessary to provide some means of access to the computer from remote remote locations scattered throughout the state this is accomplished with a teletype ne network which provides remote access to the traces database from teletype installations placed in major police departments and sheriff's office offices scattered throughout the state as of this time there are 52 teletypes tied into the traces system 39 of these are in local law enforcement agencies and the remaining 13 are in the Iowa Highway Patrol radio communications and the Department of Public Safety headquarters in addition to these 52 teletype terminals we are currently in the process of installing 20 additional terminals which will be placed in local jurisdictions in addition to access to the traces database from each of these 72 teletype terminals each of the terminals has the capability to send messages to and receive messages from each of the other terminals on the system and to send messages to some of or all of the terminals at the same time through this system all points bulletins can be broadcast throughout the state at the same time or other information concerning natural or man-made disasters crimes in progress or other information useful for the public safety of the citizens can be broadcast in addition to the interstate use of the system the traces system is also tied into three federal or interstate systems the first of these interstate interstate systems is the federal bureau of investigations and national crime information center known as ncic the ncic database provides at the national level information concerning wanted persons and stolen property as well as computerized criminal history information it is possible for iowa agencies wishing information concerning out-of-state individuals or vehicles to directly access the fbi's computer in washington to determine whether or not a specific vehicle or a specific individual is wanted or the vehicle has <coughs> been reported stolen or plates missing or, or whether or not the individual has a criminal history. The second interstate communication system is known as the National LETS or National Law Enforcement Teletype System. This system provides for teletype communications between each of the 50 states and in most cases between the major law enforcement agencies within each of those 50 states the Iowa traces terminals do not currently have direct access to this teletype system however we do have a manual interface between the Iowa traces system and the national let system and we are in the process of developing a computer interface when this is completed it will be possible for a uh, jurisdiction for instance Ames to teletype directly to a major city somewhere else in the country to inquire into information uh, concerning individuals from that jurisdiction Finally, the Iowa Traces system is a part of the ALEX system. ALEX is, stands for Automated Law Enforcement Communications System. It covers eight Midwestern states, including Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Kentucky, and Michigan. In addition to providing direct agency to agency teletype communications, this network also provides for access to the motor vehicle and driver's license databases of the participating states. It is possible through the ALEX system to determine the current status of an individual's driver's license or registration and title information concerning a motor vehicle without hum human intervention by directly accessing <coughs> the computer database of any one of the participating states. Before I leave the discussion of the TRACES database, I should point out that most of the databases discussed are not currently operational. And in order to provide you with a better feel for the current status of the TRACES system, and the work remaining to be done I would like to discuss briefly the timetable for the completion of the of the above mentioned traces databases in the traffic records database <coughs> the only database currently online to the traces terminals is the driver's license database we are currently in the process of building the motor vehicle registration database and anticipate that this database will be completed approximately July 1 of this year the accident database is still in the systems design stage and it is anticipated that programming on this database will start around June 1st of this year with a scheduled completion date of around January 1 of 1975. In the <coughs> criminal justice areas, none of the databases mentioned are currently online in the TRACES terminal network. 
We are currently testing the state's wanted persons and stolen guns files and anticipate these two files will be operational prior to July 1 of this year. The remainder of the stolen <coughs> property files will be completed during the remainder of the current calendar year and the design of the criminal history and uniform crime reporting files will commence shortly after July 1. We anticipate that it will take approximately one year to complete the design of these two databases, so we will probably not have an operational uniform crime reporting system or statewide computerized criminal history system in Iowa prior to July 1 of 1975. The question of security and privacy of information revolves mainly around the question of security and privacy of computerized criminal history information. During the first session of the current General Assembly, the Department of Public Safety sponsored legislation to protect individuals against the invasion of their security and privacy concerning prior criminal histories. Legislation which is known as Senate File 115 and which we uh, were accused many times in the legislature of trying to subvert uh, provides for control of disposition of criminal history data from the Department of Public Safety's centralized uh, criminal history files. Uh, the, the bill provides for severe <coughs> criminal and civil penalties for the improper dissemination of criminal history data from the, state, the state's central computer system. However, it provides absolutely no protection against dissemination from local files. Therefore, an individual arrested in, say, Ames and, and prosecuted in Story County would have, a, would have a criminal history in the Ames Police Department as well as in the state centralized file. The Ames Com Police Department may and probably do disseminate that information to anybody who wishes it. However, if, they, if another agency got the information from the state central file, they would be prohibited from, from disseminating it from that file. I've talked more than my 20 minutes, and uh, I believe I'll quit, and what little bit I've got left to say we'll cover uh, maybe in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. My concerns is that as we're watching the um, implementation of this technology is are we giving any thought to um, the proper use of this technology and uh, are we giving any thought to the kinds of regulations <coughs> we need to control the use of computerized databases. So we have Gordon Allen who is staff counselor for the Iceberg uh, group and for the Iowa Civil Liberties Union who is going to talk about um, laws, past, present, and future, to control or to uh, protect individual privacy. Well, unlike my predecessors, I'm geared to not speaking 50 minutes, but until the judge starts smiling. So if you want to <laughs> stop me, just smile. Um, also, unlike my predecessors, uh, my job security does not depend upon my defending computers, but critiquing them. So I will attempt to do that. Um, 
resisting a strong temptation to say a uh, funny thing happened to me on the way to this forum today. Um, I was listening to the news and a, an unnamed source identified only as the general counsel or past general counsel to the Army admitted that in 1970 the Army set up two separate computers and databases for uh, monitoring and surveillance information on some 10,000 people, individual citizens in the United States. The um, unnamed source said that the highest civilian authorities did not even know this existed <coughs> in the military, but that most of it, most of the information was unevaluated junk. Um, I'm not a computer expert, so I can't tell you what that is. That's obviously uh, sophisticated language. <laughs> the um, majority of my remarks today will be taken from a work by Arthur Miller in the 67 Michigan Law Review, ten, page 1091. Um, entitled Personal Privacy in the Computer Age. Mr. Miller is probably one of the leading experts in terms of uh, computer databases and the rules and regulations needed and required. Um, to get on with the discussion, and I, I probably am cast in the role today of the devil's advocate, and I am attempting to come up here and criticize computers and tell you that we don't need them. Unfortunately, um, I have come to the realization that computers are an integral factor in our society and we necessarily do need them. And so consequently, the role of the civil libertarian, the role of the concerned citizen is to cast a balance between the need for efficient informational retrieval and gathering and the need for the protection of the private rights of the individual. The informational upsurge or gathering um, has really caused the problem in terms of the right to privacy. As mentioned before, um, the computer can do nothing more than you could do with a pencil and a paper and a large enough facility to hold all the paper. Um, as soon as individuals started gathering information, uh, the right to privacy was threatened. What the computer has done is exacerbated this problem by making it possible to retrieve it quickly and efficiently <coughs> and to also centralize the information. Um, there was a, a hearing conducted by the illustrious uh, Senate Judiciary Committee of other, other known fame headed by uh, Sam Irvin, who uh, Mr. Irvin fond of, of quoting everything in terms of biblical phrases, uh, in terms of an example, said that you can reduce an 11-pound, 1,225-page Bible with 773,776 words, I doubt that he counted them, to a two inch by two inch piece of microfilm. You can also reduce the 270 miles of shelf space in the Library of Congress to six filing cabinets. In 1959, the federal government had 403 computers and in 1971, they had well over 5,000. The problems caused then by the two major contributions of the computer to informational gathering, which are efficiency of retrievability and a communication over distance through uh, terminal interchanges has caused uh, an upsurge and a possibility of a national network of information. Um, this problem, as Miller points out, is, is probably the greatest threat to personal privacy. Uh, as the public domain and the public in definition of public information increases, and the need for more and more information in order to make a reliable decision, and that is the key, the search for a reliable decision. <coughs> the sphere of personal privacy is thereby decreased so that the definition of personal information is changed into <coughs> the public necessity for the reliable decision. <coughs> the essential ingredient to the right to privacy is the right to dictate access to information about oneself. There is perhaps um, no statutory or constitutional basis for the right to privacy. Um, the Supreme Court first enunciated it in Griswold. <coughs> Justice Douglas, after reading the first, second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, ninth, and tenth amendments, decided that there was a right to privacy contained somewhere in those amendments, even though not specifically stated. Uh, from thence has developed uh, the whole realm in, in terms of the right to a legal right to privacy. As stated, the information gathering and dissemination prior to the age of the computer was as great was a threat to privacy, though not as great. In other words, privacy was challenged, but it was still protectable at that time. What 
what the differences are is the amounts of information that was collected at that time was not large. It was decentralized and access to it was difficult and we lived in a mobile society in which you could, if possible, move away from your card file. In other words, an individual wanted to gain information about you, he had to go to the card file or he had to go where the um, manual files were stored and look through them. It took a great deal of time, he it took a great deal of distance, and if the individual wanted to secrete himself, he moved away from his card file, thus giving him at least a time span of, uh, of secrecy. However, after the computer, the computer has allowed dissemination to a wider audience than originally intended, which Miller calls deprivation of access control, and it has allowed the introduction of inaccuracies, which Miller calls the deprivation of accuracy control, which these two are the greatest threats to privacy which he sees. The traditional legal response has, in terms of the computer, failed. The traditional legal response in terms of constitutional law, in terms of civil law, tort remedies, was geared to the introduction of the mass communications, uh, newspaper, radio, and TV. And for those, seems to work fairly well. The computer, however, has outstripped the law. In terms of an example of introduction of inaccuracies, uh, if we take the year 1967 and we assume that 99% of all files kept by credit bureaus are accurate, and that in fact only 1% are inaccurate, in 1967 there were over 1 million files containing inaccuracies. The traditional legal response then is a suit in tort under defamation, libel, or slander. In other words, the information which has been leaked about you has libeled you personally and you therefore have a right of recovery. The defense to this, however, has been the doctrine of qualified privilege. In other words, the user of the information has an interest in you as an individual and therefore he has a qualified privilege in order to gain that information. It's often called a subscriber's legitimate interest in the affairs of the subject. Even the law treats the individual who has been uh, informationally gathered upon as an analytical specimen. He is called a subject. Secondly, the action for breach of privacy, which uh, was founded upon the Griswold analysis. The defense is there is that there's no publicity of the information. It only goes to one specific user. It's not publicized or that the information was given voluntarily by the subject and therefore there's no breach of privacy. In other words, when you fill out your questionnaire for your employment, you are filling out that information and that questionnaire for the prospective employer. Little do you know that it may one day find its way into a databa database and be disseminated amongst various other users of that database to which you did not give your consent. In other words, you have voluntarily consented to the use of that information for one purpose but not for others. Other legal problems under the traditional area are venue and jurisdiction. Venue and jurisdiction meaning where you have the place of trial if you want to sue somebody. Do you sue at the place of the terminals? Do you sue at the place of the dissemination of the information, which can be nationwide? Do you sue at the place of the database, even though the damage occurred wherever the user used the information? Uh, it provides all kinds of problems in terms of the instigation of multifarious and, and diverse lawsuits and inconsistent judgments. Another great threat of the, of the computer is the internal security within the computer itself through uh, theft, minor mechanical failures, uh, invasion of the control program, uh, theft by personnel, uh, wiretapping. The problem is uh, also exacerbated by the centralization of the information. In other words, uh, for a technological investment, in order to ascertain how to incur into that system, one can get a great amount of information back out, and the payoff on this kind of thievery is, is very great. The ultimate problem of the computer probably is its, uh, is its accessibility to novel approaches in terms of surveillance. Uh, Miller calls this womb to tomb dossier on the national network. Uh, in other words, the computer has a capacity for infer inferential retrieval. Um, 
In other words, uh, it's possible to take a computer and analyze uh, your train tickets, your plane tickets, your gasoline credit cards, your phone bills, uh, your utility bills, uh, those people who called and wrote you, all the letters you sent out, and take a composite of you and infer inferentially <coughs> retrieve that so that they can cast a prospective figure upon you and know exactly what you are and how you fit in today's society and who you see and what you eat and where you go. Um, the other second most ultimate problem is probably the depersonalization of the computer. Uh, this is most evident in the fact that even banks today uh, were supposedly in the um, formative stages of computerization. Even some banks are still yet now advertising, uh, we treat you not as an account number, but as a person. Um, the problem with computers is that they're a-religious. In other words, they've totally disregarded the concept of the fresh start, the concept of redemption. Uh, one can't run away from a computer. Um, you can't move away as American folklore tells you. You can't move to the new frontier and start over a fresh start. Um, Gary Cooper is always following you with his badge. Unfortunately, as Richard Tobin has said in the Saturday Review, we cannot assume that privacy will survive simply because man has a psychological or social need for it. It has, requires an impetus uh, among concerned citizens, among civil libertarians, among the industry itself. Miller's responses to these are fourfold, and he calls for a broad conceptual framework, and in this I think he's probably in the vanguard of a treatment of um, computerized networks. And that is that we need an interdisciplinary approach based on all fronts. <coughs> we need a technological safeguard approach. We need, uh, for example, scramblers, data encoding, storage according to sensitivity, partitions in the computer's mind, um, whatever. Uh, we need an administrative approach such as independent audits, access to such audits by the subjects, uh, a log of all the users that got into it and messed around. Uh, we need controls of the input and the output and the storage. In other words, we need restrictions on the use of what information can go in, uh, continuous update, expungement of stale data, uh, formal procedure for corrections, etc. We need a correlation of information so that if one person requests data A, automatically the computer will spit out data B. An example of this is the traces legislation which requires that if an arrest record is sought, the disposition record must also go along. And fourthly, we need the management of the information managers themselves, the development of ethical standards within the computer industry, criminal and civil liabilities. There are several suggested new legal responses to the computer age, one of which is to provide a new property right. In other words, the information which is stored in the database becomes a property of the individual, and the suit is then um, a suit in court for misappropriation of your property. The difficulty with that is that property law is usually state law, which would give you 50 different rules, um, 51 counting the District of Columbia. Secondly, how to assess damages in terms of a property <coughs> nature when the real damage to the dissemination of this information is most likely psychological. Secondly, there is, as Miller suggests, the trust theory. In other words, the information is given to the collector in trust, and he is to be treated as a fiduciary and to treat that information as your trustee. However, as Miller points out, the difficulty with trust law is it only makes lawyers rich and it doesn't solve any problems. Third is the legislative response by statute. Um, one example of this is probably the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which was passed in 1970 and made effective in 1971. The Fair Credit Reporting Act tries to meet the problems which have been outlined here by statutorily creating rights and creating obligations. Among them are the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which applies to credit bureaus and the dissemination of credit reports and credit information. It gives a right of access by statute. In other words, you have the right to go in and check out your file. It has a statute of limitations of seven years on obsolete information. It has a restriction on the dissemination of information as to the nature and purpose. Only certain kinds of information can go into your credit file and only certain kinds of information can come out. 
it has a notification to the consumer of a reliance to the detriment of the consumer by the user in other words if a credit institution refuses you a loan refuses you a credit charge whatever and in so doing has relied upon the account of the credit bureau it must so notify you that it has relied upon that account giving thus giving you an impetus to go check out your credit file for misleading information fifthly it has a right of correction sixthly it creates a statutory right of action for negligent noncompliance and willful noncompliance on the part of the credit bureau the latter giving uh, punitive damages and seventh importantly it creates a federal jurisdiction uh, you can go into the federal courts and litigate your noncompliance claim and it waives the statutory usual statutory ten thousand dollar jurisdictional amount which most federal courts have on most other kinds of cases the problems with it is that it, it is administered by the Fair Trade Commission, excuse me, which uh, is already overburdened with many of its own problems and in that respect has little time for the Fair Credit Reporting Act and it has no education mechanism. In other words, where the files are, who they're kept by, what are in the files, uh, even the existence of the law itself. Um, few individuals are aware of their rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, and thirdly, there's very little case law. That's primarily due to the short history of the act. It's only been around for about three years. It's therefore probably impossible, as shown by the Fair Credit Reporting Act, to make a statutory response to the computer problems which would cover all areas of the field. It would probably be um, a wise policy to dictate statutes for each computer database in terms of the credit area terms of the government surveillance area, in terms of tax area, whatever. Uh, trying to draft an all-encompassing statute, however, seems like a virtually impossible task, not only because of the um, various informations which go into databases, but because of the uh, distance between each of the databases and because there are some 50 states, each of which would have different rules. Miller's response, therefore, is an administrative regulations and administrative agencies. Miller advocates uh, creation of another super agency. I personally have a great deal of difficulty with the creation of another agency. What this country needs is another good agency. Um, <laughs> Miller cites the uh, advantages of flexibility of administrative rules and regulations <laughs> over statutes and he cites the shorter reaction time of, administra of administrative agencies over statutes and enforcement thereof. Um, the problem with this is seen by anyone who has tried to file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. They're an estimated 18 to 24 months behind even an investigation, let alone enforcement. Um, he says that the agency should be on an interdisciplinary approach. That is quite agreeable. Uh, representatives of the law, the business community, the computer industry, whatever, should, should be represented. The problem is that with the creation of an agency, you also...